Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Piersonet Excel Level 3 GCE. This is Paper 1, Biology B, for June 2022. This is the Part 1 video. I put the links to the Part 2 and Part 3 videos below in the discussion box. Let's begin with Question 1. Question 1 says the pathogenic effects of bacteria can be due to toxins they release. Endotoxins are released by gram-negative bacteria. Name one type of gram-negative bacteria that releases endotoxins. I could say Salmonella, E. coli, Pseudomonas, as well as H. pyroli, so any of these would earn you one mark. Next they say give one difference between the structure of gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria. The major difference is in the peptidoglycan layer. Gram-negative bacteria contain thinner peptidoglycan cell walls, while gram-positive bacteria have larger peptidoglycan cell walls. The next part says, endotoxins are usually less toxic than exotoxins. The LD50 value is the mass of the chemical per kilogram of body mass that would kill half the number of rodent animals. The LD50 value can be used to indicate how toxic a chemical is. When endotoxin has an LD50 value of 11 nanograms per kilogram, and the mean body of a group of rodents is 28 grams. They wanted to calculate the mass of endotoxins given to each rodent that would kill half of the rodents in this group. Now here the mass of the chemical which were given is 11 nanograms per kilogram and we know a kilogram is a thousand grams. So that means a thousand grams will require 11 nanograms and one gram will require 11 divided by 1000 which is that in nanograms. Now 28 grams which is that will require 11 over 1000 times 28 and that will give us 0 0.308 nanograms so that should be the amount that is required in order to kill half of the rodents of this group. Moving on, here they say state two differences other than toxicity between endotoxins and exotoxins. We also know that the nature of these endotoxins and exotoxins is different. For example, the endotoxins are lipopolysaccharides lipids and carbohydrate, while exotoxins are proteins. Endotoxins are released by only gram-negative bacteria, while exotoxins are released by both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, a zygote is formed when gametes fuse at fertilization. Explain how meiosis results in genetic variation in the gametes. Genetic variation can be caused by what happens during crossing over in prophase 1 as well as the random assortment in metaphase 1. So here I say during prophase 1 of meiosis, crossing over occurs between non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes and during meiosis, independent assortment of chromosomes occurs in metaphase 1. These two processes lead to recombination of alleles leading to genetic variation within the gametes. The next part says, describe how the process of fertilization results in the formation of a zygote from the gametes in humans. During fertilization, of course, the sperm will come into contact with a secondary oocyte, and then there will be release of these enzymes from the acrosomes that are going to digest the membrane surrounding the oocyte. So here I said, the sperm comes into contact with the membrane of the secondary oocyte. Enzymes will be released from the acrosome. This is contained within the sperm. And these are digestive enzymes. So these enzymes will digest the part of the membrane and the oocyte will go through the final stage of meiosis. Also the cortical granules are going to be released and these will cause the hardening of the membrane or you would say the zona pellucida to prevent polyspermy. The sperm nucleus will fuse with the nucleus of the ovum in order to form a zygote. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three. Malaria is a serious and sometimes fatal disease. Scientists are constantly looking for new ways of controlling this disease. Which row of the table shows the name of the pathogen that causes malaria in this classification group? We know malaria is going to be caused by plasmodium. And then the group is going to be genus because the plasmodium is a genus name and not a species name. So the answer here should be A. For B, they say one group of scientists has genetically modified a fungus to produce a spider toxin that kills mosquitoes. 
describe how a fungus could be genetically modified to produce spider toxin. To do this, they need to first find the spider and isolate the genes responsible for producing this toxin, and then they can find ways of introducing those genes into the fungus. So I said isolate the spider gene that codes for the toxin using restriction endonucleases that are going to cut the genes out of the DNA of the spider. And then use a vector like a plasmid or a gene gen to insert the spider genes into the fungus. Identify the genetically modified fungus using a suitable method and then culture the fungi in order to reproduce an increase in number. Moving on. Here they say another group of scientists has discovered a type of fungus that completely protects mosquitoes from infection by the pathogen that causes malaria. This fungus does not kill the mosquitoes. Explain why this approach is less controversial than the approach used by the scientists who are developing the genetically modified fungus. Actually, this would be beneficial because then if the mosquitoes are not infected with a pathogen, then they cannot transfer the pathogen to the humans or to other organisms that are affected by malaria. So he said because although these mosquitoes can cause malaria, they also have beneficial roles in ecosystems. So some mosquitoes are food for other organisms, so these could lose their food source if mosquitoes die. Also, killing mosquitoes could be seen as an ethical by some people. And genetically modifying fungus with spider genes could lead to unforeseen complications. Then finally, infection by genetically modified fungus could be dangerous. And if that toxin causes toxicity to those organisms, then this could be life-threatening. So this brings us to the end of question three. Let's continue to question four. Question four. Bacteria are the host of the lambda phage viruses, which is a description of a lambda phage. A lambda phage is, of course, a DNA virus, and it has a complex protein capsid, so this should be the answer. Part B says, the image shows phage viruses attacking a bacterium. So we see this is the bacterium, and those tiny ones are the phage viruses. So they say the length of this bacterium is 1.7 micrometer. Calculate the length of the labored phage and give your answer in nanometers. I use an online ruler, and then I measure this length here and then that length. We know that using ratios, the ratio of the object is equal to the ratio of the image. So since I have my image length, that for the bacterium and that for the phage, my measured lengths were for the bacteria 6.2 centimeters and for the phage 0.45 centimeters. So the image ratio is 6.2 divided by 0.45, which is bacteria over the phage. And that gave me 13.778. So this is equal to the object ratio. Since I know the actual length of the bacterium, which is 1.7 micrometer, I can divide that with the length of the phage, and that will give me the ratio. So making this the subject, x will equal to that divided by that, giving me this in micrometers. So remember, our answer should be in nanometers. When you multiply this by 1000, you get 123.387, which is going to be in nanometers. And I rounded it off to 123 nanometers. For this question, the acceptable answer should be between 103 to 143 nanometers. Here they say viruses can be cultured and a growth curve can be produced. So we grow the host cells of the virus on agar and then add the viruses to the host cells. Then view the cells under a microscope and count the number of lysed or bast cells. You repeat the counts at regular intervals. So here they say the graph shows the growth curve of the viruses. You can see this is the growth curve, the log to base 10 number of cells that are lysed, and then the time after adding the viruses to the cells, this is going to be in minutes. So next they say, explain why there was a delay before the number of lysed cells started increasing. This delay is because the viruses are still infecting cells. When they infect cells, they need to create time to produce enough proteins as well as genetic material that are going to be used for the packaging of the new viruses. So here I said, during the delay, viruses bind onto the host cell and infect the cell. And after infection, DNA synthesis and protein synthesis occur, and this takes some time. The viral particles are then assembled, and this is also a time-requiring process. Next they say, calculate the mean rate of increase in the actual number of live cells between 50 minutes and 90 minutes. So going back to the graph, we can see 
between 50 minutes this is the time at 50 minutes we can see that is log to base 10 is equal to 1.7 and at the 90 minute mark we see log to base 10 is 3.8 and then we see the difference here is going to be 90 minus 50 which is a 40. so here if the log to base 10 of n is 3.8 our n is going to be 6309.57 where n is the actual number of cells and then log to base 10 of n is 1.7 which gives us n is equal to that so the difference should be that minus that which is this divide by the change in time which is 40 and the answer is that which is approximately 156 cells per minute a sketch has been made of this growth curve here we have log to base 10 number of the lie cells and then the time after adding the viruses to the cells. They say complete this sketch to predict the shape of the growth curve after 120 minutes, assuming there is an excess of host cells. I've tried to bring this down here a little bit, not to exceed the vertical axis. So, of course, the key thing is this is going to be bigger than that gap to show that there is going to be a higher concentration of the viral particles that are infecting cells. This brings us to the end of question four. Let's continue to question five. The light-dependent stage and the light-independent stage of photosynthesis both take place in the chloroplast. The rate of photosynthesis is affected by a number of different factors, including carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. The diagram shows a chloroplast, which is that. They say, where does the light-dependent stage take place? It takes place in the thylakoids, which are those. So the answer should be A. The light-dependent stage produces hydrogen ions, where do these hydrogen ions accumulate? The hydrogen ions will accumulate within the thylakoids. So again, the answer is going to be A. Down here they say, where does translation take place? Now translation is part of protein synthesis and it should take place in the ribosomes. So the answer should be a U. These tiny particles here are the ribosomes. Next page. Part B says, scientists measure the effect of two different concentrations of carbon dioxide on the rate of photosynthesis at different leaf temperatures in one species of plant. The results are shown in the graph. So here we can see the rate of photosynthesis on the vertical axis, and down we can see the leaf temperature. And these are plants grown in low level of carbon dioxide and plants grown in high levels of carbon dioxide. We see for plants grown in high levels of carbon dioxide, as the leaf temperature increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases more than those in lower levels of carbon dioxide. So the first question says, which units are suitable for measuring the rate of photosynthesis in leaves? Because here it depends on the surface area of the leaf that has been exposed, the units should be per area per second. So here I said micromole per area per second, whereby area is meter squared per second, or which is time. So the answer should be a C. Moving on. Here they say, analyze the data to identify three conclusions that can be made from this graph. Based on the graph, like I already a little bit explained, the rate of photosynthesis increases with increase in temperature until the optimum temperature is reached. And then the optimum temperature is higher for plants growing in higher levels of carbon dioxide than those in lower levels of CO2, like we can see here, this is higher and that is lower. Also, the rate of photosynthesis is faster among plants growing in high levels of carbon dioxide. You saw the curve was quite high. And the optimum temperature for photosynthesis for plants in higher carbon dioxide levels is about 37 degrees Celsius. Here they say, explain the effects of carbon dioxide concentration and temperature on the rate of formation of GALP. We know that GALP is formed in the light independent reactions and CO2 is fixed using Rubisco enzyme. So enzymes are temperature sensitive. The higher the temperature, the higher the fixation rate or the higher this enzyme is going to work until the optimum temperature for that enzyme is reached. So here I said, as temperature and carbon dioxide concentration increase until the optimum temperature, more milk gulp is produced. And as carbon dioxide concentration increase, Rubisco fixes carbon dioxide at a faster rate. As temperature increases, Rubisco and the substrate, which is CO2, collide with more energy, leading to more successful collisions. If this increases the rate of reaction. More ribulose bisphosphate is converted into glycerate 3 phosphate, leading to a faster rate of photosynthesis. So this brings us to the end of question 5, as well as to the end of this first part of this paper. 
Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.